How's it going everybody? This is my 1963 Bridgeport Mill. I want to do an overview video of it and just talk a little bit about how I got it, what I paid for it, and what I've done to it so far to set it up for my workflow. So um, first off I, uh, I got this as a parts machine. So this thing was being parted out, it was a CNC machine, and it pulled off all the CNC components. So when I got it, it was pretty much a carcass. There was It was missing the uh, Y lead screw. It didn't have the XY nut. Um, there were no handles on it. No mounts for the handle here on the front. <clears throat> all the gears that run the power down feed, all that was missing. It was an uh, MT40 uh, taper spindle. And, uh, the motor and the step pulleys were here. But other than that, it was, uh, it was missing a lot of parts. So, uh, it was a CNC shop that was getting rid of it, made a deal with the guy, I bought it for $100. I know what you're thinking, I'm like, wow, that's a smoking deal. Well, it, it, it is for a carcass, but once I got it home and had to order all the parts to make it working again, it costs about the same as what you see them going for on the market nowadays. Um, all said and told, I'm probably just shy about $3,000 into this machine. Uh, to get it operational, just to get it operational, I think I spent $2,300. Um, and then the extra money that get up to that $3,000 mark, that's for tooling and accessories. One thing that's kind of cool about this machine that I didn't realize until I got home and dug into it was it has um, a wear material. It's like a, a roll of plastic that's been cut and set on the ways here. It's glued down. And it's called either Turkite or Rulon. And what that is, is when you have a worn out set of ways, <clears throat> they put this roll of plastic, they cut it to the size of the way, and they glue it down. And then you can hand scrape in that material, that plastic, and that plastic is kind of a sacrificial wear part, and that's a wear down before the metal will. So it sits on this saddle here, on the top side of the saddle, and on the bottom side of the saddle. So. The tolerances of this machine, even though it's older and been well used, are still pretty good. Um, pricing for these, if you were to buy one new today, $17,000 to $20,000. Uh, back in 1963, this thing sold for $1,820. In today's money, that would be $17,384. So these were not cheap back then. Um, it was quite the uh, investment to buy one. So when you're seeing them online for two to three thousand dollars, I mean that's you're getting a lot of machine for that if it's still, you know, usable and still within tolerances. <coughs> as far as how I have it set up here, um, this is all my common use items right here. Um, my DRO, my control for my run of my VFD, and then just my wooden way covers here or uh, wooden T slot covers here. As far as when I'm running it, something for safety that I found that really helps out, I've taken these two pieces of plexiglass and made a clamping mechanism. So there's some steel here that has a screw in it and it clamps it in. And I can set these pieces of plexiglass on this table here and then take a third piece and it clamps in with these paper holders. These are just holders that are designed to go on your computer screen to hold a piece of paper while you're typing on it. They work great for holding plexiglass as well. And when I'm running a mill, this is keeping all the chips kind of in this zone here. They'll still fall out on the floor, but it's also preventing them from flying off and hitting me. Um, so it just uh, keeps things more sterile. Finding parts for this thing was pretty straightforward. eBay and H&W machine. Uh, I was able to get everything to get this thing running again. I was lucky enough to find a donor head where I was able to harvest off all the components for the power down feed, the coil handle, the lock, everything came off of a donor head. Uh, lighting setup, I have what's called a ring light here, uh, or a halo light, depending on what you search for on Amazon or eBay, and it's just a 12 volt LED light that provides light in a 360 degree pattern here so I don't get the shadows. I have this little spotlight here on the side and I have a big light there for just overall work. When you're standing at the operator's spot, this is what you see. The first thing you have to do when you come up to this machine is 
I have these safety glasses sitting in an inconvenient spot. So I have to physically move these to be able to run this machine. And if I don't have a pair on my face, since I already have them in my hand, they go on my face. I don't want to get stuff in my eyes. Uh, moving over here, so this is just a swing out uh, rack that I have, and it has all my common use collets. as a pair of parallels that hang right here on the side. Right here is the wrench that I use to tighten and loosen my drawbar, and this is just a magnetic mount that I use for cell phones that goes in your car. I've just repurposed it here, and that holds the wrench. I have my shell mill and my boring bar. In this little cubby here, I have my Allen wrenches that I use for adjusting the boring bar. <clears throat> I painted them all the same color, so I remember that they go to the boring bar. I also keep a center drill and a small drill bit here. On the side here, I keep my uh, chip brush and also a spanner wrench for tightening my drill chuck. On the side here, I have this little bracket that holds a hammer that I use for tapping in my part and also for uh, opening up the, hitting the draw bar. And also I have the original handle that goes for my Kurt Vice. So all common use stuff I keep right here. And this is just a repurposed uh, cleaner bottle that puts some CRC 3-36. It's just a penetrating oil. It's their version of WD-40. Moving over to the table here, I have some OSB pieces of or a uh, piece of wood here that this is what I use to keep the chips out of the T-Track. And the reason I use OSB is two reasons. One, I had it laying around and it's free. And two, when I'm uh, dropping a collet, or I'm changing my end mills, what I'll do is I move my table over so my uh, end mill is directly over this piece of wood. Usually that's because this is so high that I would have to move it over anyway. Uh, and then I come up here and I'm opening up the collet, so loosening that draw bar. And sometimes when I do that, that end mill will drop straight down. And I don't have time to catch it. If I'm over the vise or if I'm just on this metal ways or the metal uh, table right here, since I use carbide a lot, it will break the end mill. So by having the wood here, that saves my end mills because they land on the wood and it's more forgiving than metal is. Right here I have this uh, 3 8 inch ratchet, it's a little stubby ratchet, and this is what I use for tightening and closing my uh, vise. I'm uh, eventually going to get a speed handle for it or build one. Uh, the reason I used a ratchet is because if I have the vise turned 90 degrees, then I can just use it to make open and close it because I can't make full rotational turns. Up here I have the uh, my quill control handle, and this is the adjustable one where you pull it out it pulls the pin and then you can put it in whatever position you want. So you can always have it in an ergonomically convenient position to do drilling operations. Over here on this side, this is my fine feed control for my down feed. I just made this out of a piece of aluminum uh, pulley. It was just a fun little project for me just to learn how to use a boring bar and um, just do some basic milling. Eventually I'm going to build a fancier one of those, but there's some scrap that I had laying around and just wanted to mess around and so there it sits. It works for right now. Uh, moving over to the other side here, I have this little flexible light, so I use this for uh, adjusting my light. I also have the ring light down here and then I have a big light up top. The DRO, like I said, this is a Chinese version. This is a 2 auto. I got it off eBay and ordered it directly from China. It took a while to get here, but it was the cheapest option, and I'm pretty happy with it. This is my control box right here for my uh, variable frequency drive, because this is a three-phase motor. So the VFD actually sits back up here on the wall, and then this is just the remote right here. I have a bracket down here that holds my handle for my... Uh, Raising and lowering my knee. As you can tell, this thing's been welded up. And that's kind of what you see from the operator's position. So now we're going to take a look at the back side of this machine and how I've set up the wiring. So for cable management, I have four wires that come down. Three of them go to my linear scales, and then the other one is a power cable that runs to my uh, power feed. 
just have them wrapped up and then they walk around the back of the machine. Back here I have a little power box that runs powered for my DRO lights and power feed. I also keep my hold down clamps there on the side and then in the very back there you can just see I've used it kind of as storage. Coming up to the top here I have a bracket that holds my light and we'll go around to the other side. So coming around on the other side of the machine here you can see I have my cable this runs down this has my uh, power and all my wires for my DRO. They, all the extra slack is just hung right there and you can see that uh, power distribution box right there which gives me electricity for my lights and DRO and power feed. The way I have this set up is this is a two wire operation to plug in in the morning so this is my 220 volt power supply and then this is my 120 volt power supply. This little, it's probably not showing up very well on the camera, but this is a badge holder that I have just hanging here. So when I unplug this, it holds my wire there, so I don't have to go digging around for it on the ground when I want to plug this in. It's just hanging there, I can grab it, plug it in, and we're good to go. A little tight back here, so I have to move some stuff out of the way. So right here, this little storage box here. This is where I keep my right angle drive adapter and my dividing head. So they sit in there, I just have a piece of wood that's cut to the size in there. Down here you can see my Bozier, Bozier I'm probably butchering the name. Um, this is just an electric oil pump, so it just pumps oil up. Anytime I have this turned right here, that's just a timer and then that runs this. Right here you can see how I've run the wire for this light. So this is an automotive light so they just give you these two little wires here and I've wrapped electrical tape on them and in that electrical tape I've held in place with magnets and in that way they're movable as I rotate the head or tilt the head. And Then they run back and then they just go to a 12 volt power source. Up here you can see the step pulleys for the motor. So I'm over here at my arbor press and this is where I keep other supplies for the milling machine. So I have this tray that rolls out here and this tray has my uh, different height parallels. So from really low to the full size parallels there. I have the less common use collets and then this tray right here, this is how I organize all my end mills. So the ones that I do not keep inside these little uh, their individual containers, that's just to remind myself that they have chips on them. So like this one, the flutes down here at the bottom are all uh, boogered up, but the ones on the side are just fine. So I can still use this for side end milling. Or if I have a part that's really gonna tear up an end mill, I'm gonna grab these ones first. I also have my uh, edge finder here, or my center finder. So I can put this in the mill and when I'm trying to zero my DRO, I use this for that. Can pull this out, it's convenient, it's easy to grab, and then when I'm done with it, it slides back in here, so just nice out of the way. I have my vacuum cleaner that lives down here, and I run my vacuum cleaner with a remote, so I can grab my hose here, go over to the mill as I'm doing my operations, and vacuum up chips as I'm going. I don't use compressed air to blow off parts, I always use a vacuum cleaner, or I use a chip brush and a uh, towel to wipe them off. The reason I don't like compressed air is because it shoots stuff all over the place and it will shove chips uh, into places that doesn't belong, like into your ways, into your lead screws, into parts of the vise. So I just like the vacuum cleaner. Uh, over here I have this piece of plexiglass. I keep a couple pieces up here usually and that allows me to build my enclosures to kind of just control the chips. And then I have this drill that lives here that has an adapter that goes on to my knee here. And this is how I raise and lower the knee when I have to go up or down quite a bit. That keeps my shoulders from getting worn out using a hand crank. Down here I have a scrap bin. So kind of the idea here is just to keep everything easy to reach. When I need it, I can pull it out. And when I don't, it tucks in nicely. 
Eventually I'm going to build a nicer enclosure for this. Uh, try to keep the dust off of it because I know it's not great to have the parallels out exposed like this. But for right now, this is working pretty good. Let's talk safety really quick. So this is a handful of metal chips that come off my mill. And as you can see, they're pretty tiny. And one day I was running the mill and a chip about this size flew off, hit the underside of my baseball cap, and then bounced down behind my safety glasses and landed in the bottom eyelid between my eyeball and eyelid. <clears throat> it was deep enough in there that I couldn't get it out. Uh, I tried looking in the mirror, couldn't see it. So the way I got it out was I grabbed a small magnet like this, a clean nitrile glove, shoved the magnet up into the finger of the nitrile glove, and stuck that in my eye and was luckily able to capture that chip. If this was not a magnetic material, say aluminum, then I would have been taking a trip to the ER. So just uh, be aware that you can do everything right safety-wise and still get hurt with one of these machines. Okay, that about uh, covers everything for the mill. Thank you guys for checking out the video. If you guys have any questions about stuff I didn't cover on here, please feel free to ask those questions in the comments and I'm gonna try to answer them to the best of my ability. I'm by no means an expert on these things. Um, I'm a novice and I'm a home shop hobbyist at best, so. You know, just keep that in mind. If you guys get something out of these videos, please hit the subscribe button. Because what that will do is that will help the YouTube algorithm out, and that will also help the channel out. So, I'm going to try to do more videos on each individual machine I have here in the shop. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoy these. Thank you guys for watching, and have a great day.